Now, this graphic sequence, I, I concocted this graphic sequence earlier this year. I gave a conference in Sweden, in Stockholm, Sweden, on radioactive waste. And one of the things about geological storage, which the nuclear industry likes to put forward, is that this solves the radioactive waste problem. And because it solves the radioactive waste problem, you can stop worrying. Because now we know what to do with it, and that means we can now go ahead and build more reactors because this problem is, this, this pesky problem is off the table. Well, um, I did a little bit of thinking about this, and I put together this graphic to show why geologic storage cannot solve the high-level radioactive waste problem if you have an ongoing nuclear program. In other words, if the nuclear reactors continue to operate, and especially if they are increasing in number. The reason is because if you have one reactor, each one of those red dots indicates one year's worth of spent fuel. And after two years, of course, you're going to have two dots. After four years, you've got four dots. I'm a mathematician. I figure these things out. After eight years, you've got eight dots. And what happens is, now I've changed the color because as the fuel gets older, it doesn't generate as much heat as it did originally. So the heat, the heat is getting a little bit cooler, but still hot. Uh, so what happens is you get this vast accumulation of radioactive, and that's exactly what's happening today. What's happening is all that high-level waste is right there on the site of the nuclear reactors. It's not going anywhere. Now, uh, people have complained about this. They've said, whoa, nuclear waste all right there in the reactor. This is bad. Nuclear power is therefore not a good energy source. The industry says, no problem. We have the solution. It's geologic storage. So here's what happens if you have geologic storage. Well, for the first two years, of course, nothing is different because this waste is much too hot to move. It's got to stay in the pool. For the first four years, no difference. For the first eight years, no difference. For the first 16 years, well, now, uh, you know, if you're really optimistic, you might think that you could bury this part. There's no way you can bury, possibly, you can't possibly bury the stuff that's less than 10 years old. As a matter of fact, I've been told by the German scientists that you can't possibly bury it until it's at least 30 years old. But let's be optimistic. Suppose you could bury the stuff that's more than 10 years old, then this is the portion that you can bury, and that's the portion you cannot bury. Turns out that 90% of the heat and 90% of the radioactivity is in that first 10 years worth of spent fuel. So you have not solved the problem, because the catastrophe potential is still there. It's right there at the surface, not buried, now, what's more, if you use this as a justification for building more reactors, then you have two reactors and you have two times 10 years worth of unburied spent fuel. And if you increase the number of reactors, you simply increase the problem. So my point is that if you have a growing nuclear power program, even if you bury the waste faster than humanly possible, you will still have an ever-growing inventory of unburied high-level radioactive waste at the surface. You have not solved the problem. So I think it's important for people to realize that some of these uh, talks about solving problems is more talk than reality. This, in my opinion, is not a solution to the problem. It is a solution to a public relations problem, but not a solution to a safety problem. If you had a complete phase out of nuclear power, such as Germany is doing, then of course that's a different story because there will not be, after 10 years, all that very hot stuff will no longer be so very hot. And as time goes on, it will get cooler, and then it is physically possible to remove all the irradiated fuel from the vicinity of the reactor. But until they're shut down, it's not possible. Okay, now there's also other types of waste, and this is important because the high-level waste is something which the federal government of Canada has agreed that they will take some responsibility for. They say, we will take the high-level waste from all the Canadian reactors and ensure that something is done responsibly with this high-level waste. But there's other types of waste, low-level and medium-level waste, which the federal government has absolutely no responsibility for and says, that's your problem. And these wastes will be the problem of Alberta if you build a reactor here. So you're going to have to look after these wastes here. And those wastes probably aren't going to go anywhere far away from where the reactors are built. Uh, here we have the Bruce Nuclear Complex in Ontario, 
one of the largest nuclear complexes in the world. There's nine reactors there, uh, and they're busily refurbishing many of them. And they also store a lot of the radioactive waste from all the other nuclear reactors in Ontario. They store the contaminated materials. Now, these materials here, although they're called low and medium level waste, they're actually the same, in many cases, it's the same kind of stuff that's in the high level waste. It's just not irradiated fuel. And if it's not irradiated fuel, they never call it high level waste. For example, in the pools, when the water's circulating, they have filters that filter out the tiny amounts of radioactivity that are given off by little cracks and pinholes in the fuel. And so these filters become very, very radioactive. And they contain the exact same fission products which are in the fuel, which build up over a period of time. It's like you know taking a vacuum cleaner bag out, uh, except this is radioactive stuff. And that's what goes into these holes. So you've got here very dangerous stuff, consisting of the same type of materials that's in the high-level waste, but in a much less compact form. And they're stored in these kind of uh, things that go down into the ground. But they also remain dangerous for many, many centuries. And then you have uh, uh, things like the feeder pipes. Now, this is a picture of the feeder pipes. You can see how difficult it is to try and, and, to try and monitor the feeder pipes, to try and keep track of how, how, in what good shape they are. They're just so closely packed. And also, they become very highly radioactive because there's something called activation going on. They actually, the materials in the pipe itself are turned into radioactive atoms by what's called neutron activation. That's a little complicated, but neutrons are flying around inside the reactor. The neutrons are what cause the splitting of the uranium atoms. And when these neutrons are flying around, if they hit a non-radioactive atom, one of two things happens. Either they bounce off or they get absorbed. And when they get absorbed, they can turn a non-radioactive atom into a radioactive atom. So things which were previously non-radioactive become intensely radioactive. And that's why even the reactor structures themselves become radioactive waste. So it's not just a case of taking the fuel out of the reactor. The pipes become permanent radioactive waste. Now these pipes, the calandria tubes inside the reactor, they are made of the finest quality stainless steel you will ever find in the world. That stainless steel can never be reused or recycled. It has to be buried as radioactive waste because it's now become too radioactive. And it will remain dangerously radioactive for thousands of years. Uh, so when they refurbish the reactors, they get a whole new category of radioactive waste, which is the refurbishment waste. And those also have to be stored for a very long period of time, many thousands of years. I don't believe that uh, any private company is going to stick around for several thousand years looking after these wastes. Uh, it's going to become a legacy of the Alberta government, and it's going to be some, something which those people are going to have to look, uh, look after. Um, here we have also activation, other activation materials which are buried underground. Those little kind of pipes and things that are sticking up are various monitoring devices for keeping track, a little bit at least, of what's going on underground. There is a certain amount of seepage, there is a certain amount of leakage, and they try and minimize that as much as possible by trying to, first of all, monitor for it and take corrective action if they can. Um, and of course, they've got drums and materials. This material, I have to tell you, is not actually Canadian material. This is from the United States Weapons Program. The reason I showed the picture is because I don't have a similar picture from the Canadian scene. But these are wastes that are produced in the American military program for producing bombs and so on. But we have similar types of wastes in Canada. And sometimes they package them, oh, now you look at those things. What do you suppose those are? If you look at them, they kind of look like little segments of pipes or something. But if you go down closer, you find out that they're actually much bigger. And uh, what they actually are are the hulls of nuclear submarines. And the hulls of the nuclear submarines, because of the nuclear reaction taking place, they have become activated. And they are now radioactive waste. So those trenches that you saw before is where they're trying to bury the hulls of these, of these submarines. That's going to be a radioactive waste site for a long, long time. 